So uh, good afternoon. We'll uh, segue into the next session. Uh, my name is Madhusan Peshwa. I run the therapeutics business for MagSite. Uh, we were told to focus on sort of from an educational perspective, talking about what is the current state of the art in terms of how cell and gene therapies are being developed for immuno-oncology applications. We have a fantastic panel with a very diverse set of experience. And I will introduce the panel and ask them to introduce themselves later on. But we have representatives, uh, Tina Albertson on the far right, who is medical director at Juno. Isabella Riviera from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Reiner Brangens, who you already heard reference to previously, uh, also from Sloan Kettering. Kimberly Noonan from Johns Hopkins. And Kimberly is also involved in a new startup that's been spun out from Johns Hopkins. And uh, uh, Sean Leland from Argos Therapeutics. And uh, as we go through this, uh, each of them will describe what it is that they do. So I was asked to give a five-minute overview on immunology uh, from an educational perspective. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not a physician. I'm not an oncologist or even an immunologist. So bear with me. I will try and lay it out from a layman's perspective. So at the end of the day, basically in our whole body, as you heard Dr. Rosenberg talk about, there is this constant battle of cells getting mutated and being recognized by the immune system and being cleared by the immune system. So the basic mechanism by which this happens is cells all express a particular set of fingerprints called antigens. And when a cell gets mutated, it creates a novel fingerprint. And when it dies, that mutated elements or antigens from that cancer cell get picked up by what are called antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells. They get presented to the effector arm of the immune system, which are the T cells. And those T cells then infiltrate through the blood vessels into the tumor tissue to recognize and keep the tumor in check. And it's a perpetual cycle. It's a balance. Sometimes what happens, and we don't know why, the surveillance is not able to keep the tumor in check. And that's where cancer progresses. So one way of thinking about how one can apply cell-based processes for immunotherapy is really think about where are there opportunities to mediate in this cycle to try to restore the balance. One approach could be at the position of educating the immune cells, which are the dendritic cells. So that could be one strategy. The other strategy is at the level of the effector cells recognizing and killing cancer cells. So there are dendritic cells educate T cells via molecules called HLA class one and class two molecules and other supportive molecules that provide strength of binding and interaction to trigger activation of these T cells. Now what happens is once these T cells get activated, as you heard very eloquently from Dr. Rosenberg, they metastasize, go inside into the tumor space and do their job. But the tumor is smart too, right? So it finds ways to prevent being detected and killed by these effector T cells. And so the immunosuppressive environment in the tumor becomes really critical. So there are really two components on the T cells that allow you to modulate the function of these T cells. On one level, it is the T cell receptor that engages with the HLA molecule. And in the process of natural selection, our T cells have been recognized not to recognize self-antigens, right? Otherwise, they're gonna go around on a rampage and kill their own body parts. And so there is a natural avidity and affinity-based selection of what antigens the T cells recognize, self versus non-self. And the fact that cancer represents a mutated cell enhances the avidity and specificity of recognition of the specific mutations as we talked about. The other component on the T cells are the signaling molecules. And again, Dr. Rosenberg referred to as the yin and the yang. So there are molecules such as IL-2 or IL-12 that can be immunostimulatory, but at the same time, there are checkpoint molecules such as PD-1 and others that actually inhibit the activation of the T cells. So what we want to do as developers is enhance the immune effectiveness 
But what the tumor is trying to do is suppress the immune effectiveness at the same time. And these T cells need to function in an environment that the tumor is trying to get a selective and competitive advantage over. Okay? So as people have looked at this, they've said rather than relying on natural occurring T cell receptors, can we engineer these T cell receptors to increase their specificity and avidity to recognize tumor cells more specifically? The other aspect where people have said is, well, we've learned a lot from antibody therapies. Can we now create a chimeric molecule where we take an antigen recognition portion from an antibody and artificially couple it to T cell signaling portions? So in effect, we can redirect the specificity of a T cell to a desired cell surface protein receptor. So there's really two approaches to engineering T cells using what are called engineered T cell receptors or engineered chimeric antigen receptors or CARs and TCRs. Now immunologically, each of them recognizes a different set of antigens. It recognizes different forms of antigen and recognizes antigen presented either as a surface protein or as a small peptide from an antigen bound to the HLA molecules. But that level of technical detail we don't necessarily need to get into. Okay. Now how does one make these engineered T cell receptor or CAR T cell cells. It's a pretty complex manufacturing process. You have to make it for each individual. You have to isolate the right cells. You have to transduce them typically with a virus, although there are some non-viral approaches people have used, so that the resulting T cells will express these artificial molecules. Then you need to expand them to large numbers because it's again a numbers game and then you need to infuse them back. Typically, the whole process may take five days, may take 10 days, sometimes even two weeks. But the process of testing and release often takes an additional two to three weeks. So by the time you collect cells from a patient to the time you treat a patient, it could very well be four to six weeks, which is a pretty long time given that in a lot of these patients, the disease is rapidly advancing and progressing. So there's a lot of questions from a scientific perspective. What's the right cell to use? What's the right molecule to use? And what's the right disease indication? Should we take patients' own cells and modify them? Can we take donor cells? Can we have a universal cell? These are all issues hopefully the panel is going to uh, opine upon as we go forward. What has been really exciting when people have really embarked on this in the more recent past is the clinical responses have been really unprecedented. Although majority of the responses have been in uh, ALL, which is a B cell malignancy, that expresses targeting a CD19 cell surface expression. But we've seen in the range of 90% complete remissions in ALL patients. Never before any other oncology intervention has led to that level of clinical efficacy. That's really what is exciting about this field and shows the power of the technology. But having said that, at the same time, the same antigen, a different disease, CLL, we're seeing 50 to 60% complete remissions. Again, phenomenally strong in terms of the outcome, but different than what we see in ALL. So there are disease-specific differences, potentially, that could lead to different outcomes in different, although you're, you have the same cell and the same targeting moiety. The other concern that people have been thinking about, it's one thing to treat a patient in an academic setting, but it's an entirely different thing to commercialize it and make it available for large numbers of patients. How do you do this on a more routine basis? What are other collateral toxicities one needs to be concerned with? And eventually, how can one take the learnings that we have today and expand it beyond CD19 and B-cell malignancies to really solid tumors? And how do you bring in other learnings about immunology to bear to design a product that will work in other settings to allow us develop treatments more effective for patients with other devastating diseases. And that really is the challenge for the field. But having said that, it takes a village at the end of the day. And it all, part of the village is also the financing community. And the initial results have really led to the excitement from the investment community, which has really triggered and allowed a domino type cascading effects in terms of accelerating the research and the development and you've heard some of these example companies that some of them, for example, didn't exist three, four years ago. And these are very large, well-funded companies that are really leading the cutting-edge development in terms of driving some of these early discoveries into 
the commercial realm. And so to come back and complete the cancer immunity life cycle, uh, we have, Sean is really gonna focus and talk to us about the dendritic cell aspect in terms of how dendritic cells activate the immune system to recognize cancer. Kim will talk to us about, similar to infiltrating lymphocytes, where are their sources of other infiltrating lymphocytes and how one can leverage them in treating patients. And the others, we will talk about what exactly it is that we're doing in terms of CAR T cells and TCR engineered T cells and where we see this whole field approaching and going forward. So we had a brief email exchange and we decided uh, to have the following agenda as an outline. At this point with this background, hopefully that was a little more than five minutes but gives you sort of the background and the framework to understand the rest of the discussion. And I'm gonna go in a particular sequence as I ask people to introduce themselves, uh, which follows that cycle. So I'll start with you, Sean. Thanks, Pastor. Uh, I'm Sean Leland. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Corporate Development and Strategy at, at Argos Therapeutics. Um, so as Pastor mentioned, uh, Argos Therapeutics is developing a personalized cancer immunotherapy approach uh, leveraging dendritic cells to activate and differentiate a very specific type of, of memory T cell response. Uh, we use a, a platform technology called Arcellus to do this, uh, and there are three components that are necessary that we use in our product to activate and differentiate these very specific type of, of memory T cells. So the first step in our process is actually to uh, take either a uh, sample of the tumor uh, that's either from a surgical procedure or from a biopsy. Uh, we've actually produced our product from as little as uh, five milligrams of tumor tissue, so a, a really small amount of tumor tissue. And once we get that tumor sample um, at the, the Argos manufacturing facility, what we do with that sample is we isolate the messenger RNA, which is representative of what Dr. Rosenberg described as the proteins or antigens that are present across that patient's tumor surface that allow our immune system to recognize uh, and, and direct uh, an actual immune response uh, to the patient's cancer. So from that total tumor messenger RNA payload, we're leveraging messenger RNA that's representative of both normal overexpressed antigens as well as neoantigens which is what we're leveraging in that total tumor messenger RNA payload to stimulate a robust immune response. In addition to the tumor collection, uh, we also have a patient go through an apheresis procedure, which is a blood collection. Uh, we collect monocytes from that blood collection procedure, and then we maturate those monocytes into dendritic cells, which are essentially the delivery vehicle um, that allows us to, to deliver and present the messenger RNA to the immune system. So the, the final product and, and the final component that goes into the product is actually a, a component which is synthetic CD40 ligand messenger RNA. And that component actually allows us to overcome tumor-induced immune suppression. So Argos actually had a precursor product before our, our lead product, which is AGS003. That, that precursor product was just the fully maturated dendritic cells loaded with the total tumor messenger RNA. It did not contain the synthetic CD40 ligand messenger RNA. And what we found is that that product produced uh, two out of the three signals necessary to activate T cells, but it didn't produce a third. And we, we actually didn't find that out until we went into the clinic. So the, the whole point of this is just to really emphasize how smart cancer is and the necessity, especially as we move forward into solid tumors, to engineer in specific components that uh, overcome tumor-induced immune suppression. And that's really what the, the importance of the, the addition of the synthetic CD40 ligand is. So the final product that we actually engineer into the patients is the fully maturated dendritic cells loaded with the total tumor messenger RNA payload, which is gonna be representative of all the antigens that are present on the patient's tumor surface. And then we also engineer in the synthetic CD40 ligand messenger RNA. And that allows us to produce a, a very specific memory T cell response. And that memory T cell response that we're able to produce with our product, we've actually been able to show in clinical trials, specifically in our, our phase two clinical trial, it was actually correlating 
uh, that increase in those memory T cells actually correlates with survival, progression three survival, and tumor response. And we just completed a enrollment to a phase three study uh, in July of, of 2015 in metastatic kidney cancer, and we expect data from that study uh, in the first half of 2017. Thank you, Sean. We'll move on to Kim. Okay, thanks, Peshwar. So um, I think I might be coming from one of the brand new, most new um, immunotherapy companies um, when Mill Therapeutics were three weeks old as of yesterday. Um, so I'm just transitioning out of academia, which is where actually the um, technology was born. So I work with Yvonne Borello at Johns Hopkins University. He's an MD who sees myeloma patients, and um, it's nice to see Steve Rosenberg here today because he was one of the um, inspirational uh, leaders in, in the work that we originally started to do. So he was talking about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We focus on marrow infiltrating lymphocytes because at first we were very simple, um, very simple scientists and thought that well. And m multiple myeloma patients where the tumors in their bone marrow will go to the bone marrow and see if we can find um, antigen-specific T cells there. And we did, and we were able to show that we can take those cells out of the bone marrow, grow them up through some specialized processes that we've developed, give them back to the patients. And a lot of patients actually respond very well to those cells. Um, what we have subsequently studied is that these cells can also poten potentially be effective um, for solid cancers and for um, post-allogeneic um, transplant as well. And one of the reasons that they are effective is because there's a lot of central memory cells in the bone marrow. So the bone marrow ends up being a very unique microenvironment, and so we're studying how to use these cells in things other than myeloma. So, you know, I just said we just formed this company three weeks ago, and right now we're using it as a conduit to really understand and study things that we weren't able to study with um, typically academically funded mechanisms. So I've been working in the lab um, for 16 and a half years with Yvonne, and um, when I started, we didn't even have a research nurse or a data manager, so I did everything. Um, I met every single patient on every single one of our trials, met their families, and it's very much stuck with me, and everything that I do to this day is because I want to help people. Um, I, I'm a scientist, PhD, I don't have an MD, so there's typically not a lot of interactions with PhDs with patients, but because of my special experience, I had that interaction, and it really drives everything that I do to this day. So um, what's been extremely important to us is that patients enroll in these studies and as part of that enrollment, they give us samples that we can continue to study, much like Steve Rosenberg was talking about. Um, and you know, we can look to see how their immune system responded and learn things from patients who did well, and very importantly, learn things from patients who don't do well. So um, I have stuck with me a memory. I sat with um, a family member of one of our Mills patients who um, had a, a subcranial bleed that her rest of her family couldn't get there. And I sat with her while he passed away. And I'm only telling you this because, honestly, I wake up in the middle of the night to think of new things to do in the lab because I think of him and how we could have done better. So I'm going to move to Isabel, maybe. So um, good afternoon. Um, I'm one of the representatives of um, MSKCC program here with uh, Renee Branches, and I direct the uh, cell therapy and cell engineering uh, facility at Sloan Kettering, which means um, we manufacture the cells for the patients in, in my laboratory. Um, I just want to mention that this program has been alive at Sloan Kettering for almost 20 years and uh, was peer-edited by uh, Michel uh, Sadoulin, who um, I think uh, all his life knew that he was going to um, generate CAR T cell and infuse them in the patients. It's, I think it takes that much determination to uh, bring these uh, technologies to, uh, to our patients. Um, for many years, obviously, we worked in the trenches. And um, we are very pleased that in more recently uh, these have been uh, giving us some encouraging results which have uh, caught the attentions of biotechs and, and pharmaceutical companies. Um, so this started uh, 20 years ago when we built a um, GMP facility uh, that was uh, the vision of um, Dr. Sadler as well as the uh, institution who supported this um, 
and even uh, in parallel with um, the uh, first uh, CAR T cell um, targeted to CD19 that um, actually uh, Renier who is here, uh, demonstrated in an animal model that uh, these chimeric antigen receptor that uh, Dr. Rosenberg described um, started to demonstrate some real activities against uh, lymphomas and uh, leukemias in, in mice that um, were bearing these pre-established tumors. So this was really um, what um, laid the foundation for um, the program to move forward and uh, bring uh, the um, applications to the chronic lymphocytic leukemia and acute lymphocytic leukemia acute lymphoblastic leukemia that Dr. Branchens will um, tell you about in terms of clinical results. And um, on my hand, uh, these uh, were the foundations to uh, develop the technology to be able to bring uh, the uh, treatments to our patients at St. Kettering. And this was a long quest of uh, finding the best way to, uh, from um, a collection um, of a blood that uh, is an aphoresis uh, to finding the ways to purify the um, lymphocytes and um, activate them in a way where we could introduce the new genetic material, which was this chimeric antigen receptor that was targeted to CD19. And for uh, this, as uh, this was mentioned also by uh, Dr. Rosenberg, um, we use um, viral vectors, and these are basically derived from uh, viruses, and we use the natural property of the viruses to deliver the new genetic material into these cells. So we remove all of the um, um, genes that are unnecessary or could be harmful, and we just use the property of the virus to deliver the new genetic information into the cells. And uh, we have developed ways to specifically produce these vectors into the laboratory. So um, once we have the T cells, we mix them with the viruses and put them together in tissue culture bag, have them um, cook together for um, five to 10 days. And uh, once we have achieved the dose, we have ways to cryopreserve these cells and formulate them and keep them in the freezer until the patients are ready to be um, treated. So we have um, relatively recently achieved some uh, very encouraging results in patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and Dr. Branchens is going to talk about these results. Uh, this has led us to obtain uh, Food and Drug Administration breakthrough designation and orphan, orphan drug designation, and, um, and also because of the spectacular results that we have obtained in this disease, we have been able to set up a very fruitful collaboration with uh, Geno Therapeutics, and Tina will be able to tell you more about um, what uh, they are pursuing and, and how basically um, based on the phase one clinical trial that we have conducted at Sloan Kettering and uh, these promising results, how they are going to uh, bring these uh, to a uh, wider um, patient community and uh, hopefully to be able to commercialize uh, this product if uh, the results are all done. So, Ryan, I will go to you next in terms of the early data, and then Tina, you can tell us about how you're moving it into the commercial realm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a hacking cough, it's mine. Um, it's not contagious, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, so I started out uh, 18 years ago working with Michelle and Isabel, and, and the, the three of us actually was kind of a coming together of three people that all had different areas of expertise. Um, I'm on the leukemia service uh, as, a, as an attending physician at Stone Kettering, and I have a lab uh, which came out of, or was born from Michelle Satellane's lab. And uh, 18 years ago, Michelle proposed to me this idea that we can genetically modify T cells to recognize tumor cells, and it was a very appealing and attractive idea at the time. And at the time, I think, and I may be alone, Isabel may or may not agree, that we thought the biggest obstacle to making this work was being able to get enough of the T cells to express the virus, the viral genes that we would introduce, this chimeric antigen receptor, which was a term that the three of us actually first published, I think, back in 2001 in a review paper. We, we had debate about what they should be called. We called them CARS, which has caused a lot of uh, mirth for everyone writing up uh, headlines and so on. 
Um, and so um, the, uh, while Isabel was developing the techniques to scale this up, which was a very significant and difficult thing to do on the side of the GMP facility, <clears throat> Michelle and I were working up ways to make the cell or the chimeric receptor as optimal to be able to eradicate disease initially in mice. And as we learned more and more about this, in relative obscurity, I might add, because at the time there were very few, there were no headlines um, on, on the work we were doing. Um, we actually had the opportunity because of the institution and because of the people that we had available to us to actually move this to the clinical setting. And the first try that we had to move this to the clinical setting, we were the first to treat with retrovirally transduced CAR T cells. Took four years to, to write all of the applications that was necessary to get FDA and institutional review board approval. Um, one of the things that is fantastic about the NCI is the, the, the skill uh, uh, that they have in moving things forward to the clinical trial. And it's, again, still an obstacle to move the further iterations forward of these clinical trials. Um, when we were the first uh, to demonstrate in ALL how successful this therapy could be, I, I remember, if you want to give a single patient example, we had a patient that had a, a, a ton of disease. Um, we had made the cells, and that cost a lot of money. And um, I must say, Marco de Villa, who was the fellow at the time, uh, said, we should treat, and I said, well, I don't think it has any point, um, but we made them, so let's treat them. And the patient went into the ICU with high spiking fevers as these cells were proliferating and killing off his tumor cells. And I remember he was a very sick patient. We couldn't turn him over to get a bone marrow aspirate, so I walked in and did a sternal aspirate, which I wasn't, not too many people do them anymore. And 10 days later, and we went back and looked under the microscope, there wasn't a single tumor cell to be seen, so it was one of those real eureka moments that, that and a proof of principle that this technology can work. And it was very exciting to us at the time, and that was the third patient that we had treated, then there were five patients, similar stories. And we've now treated, I think, 51 patients is, is how many we've treated uh, with this relatively, this almost universally incurable cancer in adults. Relapse B cell ALL has a 5% three-year survival. So these patients, again, are, are have very few options available to them <clears throat> that could be proven successful. I won't, don't want to spend too much time talking, but I will say a few things about this technology. Um, one of the titles that I use for cars uh, for, for some of my talks is we have a Model A Ford, we need a Ferrari. We'll just call it a Mustang. I just got a Mustang, so we need a Mustang. And, and what that illustrates is that, that it's a proof of principle, um, but, but there's so much more that we still need to learn. It's, we clearly can re-educate T cells to recognize tumor cells. We can isolate cells to recognize tumor cells, but what we knew nothing about and what we're just now starting to learn about is what the tumor does to suppress the immune system um, and what uh, the, the various uh, activating signals that we can utilize in the T cell to be able to allow the T cell to successfully persevere within that tumor. And as we move to solid tumors as opposed to the liquid tumors, identifying targets that are suitable and identifying T cells that can recruit the other aspects of the immune system that, 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 that Steve spoke about, these neoantigen specific cells, is going to be critical to make this technology work. So the, the headlines are great. Um, it's fantastic because it's a proof of principle. It's garnered a lot of attention to the field, um, but there, is still, uh, there are still many more bridges to cross um, and many more things to add to these cars to make them into, in, in, into a Mustang. And along those lines, uh, back in the day, we had to drum up all the money to pay for these clinical trials, um, and that's where Juno uh, really was a great partnership because um, you need industry to move this from from a boutique uh, technology into something that, had, that that more more and more patients have access to. Hi, I'm Tina Alberts, and I have the pleasure of representing Juno Therapeutics today. Um, Juno uh, really has been an exciting um, evolution from all of the work that Rainier and Isabel have done at MSK as well as others at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Seattle Children's Research Institute. So we really have grown out of three uh, main founding institutions to try to bring the uh, therapies that have for now been at academic institutions um, you know, to the masses. And our, our mission really is to try to get these highly effective therapies to patients and more patients. Um, you know, I think what industry can bring, not only the money as, as Dr. Brenchens uh, mentioned, 
but really is the infrastructure to bring um, multi-center trials to patients so that it, it gets out of the one institution into the many. Um, we still are only at academic institutions at our multi-center trials, but I think our dream is one day uh, also to be at smaller cancer centers with some of these therapies. I think we need to figure out how to make them, make them efficiently and manage the patients uh, at those kinds of institutions. So we have a ways to go, but we have a mission to try to get these very complicated therapies um, into many more centers than they are today. Um, our main uh, activities right now as Juno Therapeutics are trying to bring uh, the main product that has come out of MSK uh, to approval in um, B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, as Dr. Brenchens mentioned, that has very high anti-tumor uh, activity against these very aggressive leukemia cells. We also have other products in trials that are similar, also targeting CD19, um, to try to get similar amounts of activity or anti-tumor activity in indications, so B-cell malignancies that don't have a 90% CR rate. So uh, he was discussing mostly uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but in CLL and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, we don't have quite as good of a success rate with CAR T-cells. Um, but we do uh, see activity, and what we're trying to figure out in our own multicenter clinical trials is what are the patients? What uh, characteristics that predict which patient will respond, which patient won't. Is it the microenvironment of the tumor within a lymphoma that's causing some patients' CAR T cells either not to expand, not to take up residence in those tumors, not to kill those tumor cells? So we have a lot of scientists and physicians and, and trialists working at Juno um, and manufacturing uh, scientists <coughs> to make the product and try to figure out how to get it to work in every patient. Um, and then obviously to work with the FDA uh, to try to bring those um, products to approval so that um, they don't have to go through a clinical trial to get them. I'll just mention that um, the folks at MSK and our other founding institutions continue to innovate other versions of these CAR T cells. They're also, they are highly active, not every patient uh, responds. and, and uh, Dr. Brenchens and, and others, including the scientists at Juno, are trying to figure out better ways to make CAR T cells. How can you augment the activity of, of the product itself or combine it with checkpoint inhibitors uh, to try to release the suppression that might be suppressing the CAR T cells themselves in patients? Um, we're very excited actually to have a trial like that starting this year where we might be able to tell whether the suppressive environment <coughs> of a tumor is turning off the activity of CAR T cells in some patients by combining CAR T cells with checkpoint inhibitors. So we're, we're trying to understand how to um, make CAR T cells uh, beneficial for, for all cancer patients starting with B-cell malignancies, um, but also trying to eventually get into solid tumors, use the same technology to try to uh, benefit patients with ovarian cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, all of those things that really affect um, patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'll just stop there. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, everybody. So uh, other than being the moderator, I'm going to tell you, take two minutes to tell you about what we're doing with CAR T-cells as well. So we got involved in this field of CAR T cells about six years ago, uh, coincidentally in two collaborations, one with Carl June from the University of Pennsylvania and one with Dario Campana when he was working with NK cells at uh, St. Jude Children's Hospital. He's since moved on to uh, Singapore and our collaborations continue with both of them. Both of them actually were in the early stages of development of CD19 cars and both of them independently came to a concern of how they would be able to use that therapy to treat young pediatric patients. Uh, the concern really is these CAR T cells do not distinguish between normal B cells and malignant B cells. This concept is called on target of tumor toxicity. And they wanted to have a non-viral transient approach to expressing CAR <coughs> such that they could potentially be able to treat the kids but not wipe out their normal B cell compartment. So that's sort of the flip side of it, and that's really where we got involved. And subsequent to that, we've continued to focus more from a perspective at MaxSite of how do we develop a commercially tangible means for delivering CAR T cell immunotherapy 
without using a virus, specifically targeting solid cancers, and thirdly, looking for ways and means where we could prospectively control on target of tumor toxicity. And the approach we've taken is really to go back to our roots in transfusion medicine, where we can collect an apheresis, we can load messenger RNA encoding chimeric antigen receptors into apheresis product. A single apheresis gives us about eight lots of cryopreserved product that could be infused. Each product lot expresses CAR in 95% plus of the cells, but as the cells actively divide, the CAR dilutes out over time. So active drug with each infusion is only present for between one and two weeks. So we're borrowing from the antibody world and the bispecific world in terms of saying controlled, repeated, transient administration of CAR T cells, which could all be manufactured in a matter of hours, potentially using automatable systems as point of care in future in a commercial context, would such repeat administration of transiently modulated CARs allow for a path towards commercial manufacturing and delivery and allow an expansion beyond CD19 malignancies into potentially other cancer indications as well. So, uh, you know, we touched upon sort of, uh, uh, in, in all of the talks, a lot of the current uh, state of development. One of the things that came out also in Dr. Rosenberg's presentation is a lot of these original proof concepts emerge in academic settings and then subsequently migrate out either into new startup companies like what Kim is describing or into partnerships with commercial entities to drive it towards clinical development. Now, what I would kind of come back and ask Kim and then the team from Sloan Kettering to describe their own experiences in terms of when you spun out, why you spun out, uh, and what was the pluses and minuses. Again, I want to save some time for further discussion, so please be brief in your comments. Okay, so um, I told you we sort of built this from the ground up at Hopkins. Uh, Hopkins is a major academic center, but had done no cell therapy or no T cell therapy before we started working on it. And so we built everything from the ground up um, as far as even teaching the GMP how to grow the cells of interest that I had started growing in the research lab. And so we grew this up to a certain point. Um, we're in a multi-center phase two cl clinical trial right through Hopkins already. Um, but we sort of hit a ceiling um, as far as finances go of how much further we could go. So the current um, study that we're doing um, and we're doing it um, as usual, as we do as academicians, um, you know, scraping together each penny um, is $5 million. So, a university setting isn't a place where we can continue to develop and grow this. And so that's why we decided to spin out into a company where we could bring money um, from people that were interested in our work and they could actually invest and we could grow this even further so that we could hopefully take this to even more patients outside of Hopkins. I did mention we are a multi-center study. And um, for the most part, um, we are working with big, um, other big academic institutions, but we have now partnered with Northside Hospital in um, Atlanta, Georgia, which is not a big academic center. However, it is a transplant center and an excellent transplant center. So it's still close to being an academic center. And I think a few people have described how it's, um, I think one of the next steps to really get this to more people is how do we get it from these big academic centers um, to centers that aren't used to dealing with these types of patients, with these types of products, how do you infuse them, how do you store them. I mean, there's little nitty gritty details that we've worked on. Um, so that's why we transitioned. And the pluses and minuses, well, we're three weeks old. <laughs> so I'm not sure I know the pluses or minuses. I told someone, um, you know, I always thought there was an age when you knew what you were doing, like, you know, I know what I'm doing. I have no idea, I, you know, I'm the CSO. What does that mean? I don't know. But <laughs> I'm continuing to do my work and continuing, you know, to do what I was doing at Hopkins and trying to interact with more people such as yourselves um, and, and, and really um, trying to do better what we've been working on all these years, so. Thank you, Kim. And from Sloan Kettering's perspective, it was a lot more mature. <laughs> Maybe. Immature. <laughs> We actually gave the baby to Juno, and it was a very painful uh, <laughs> process for emotionally, <laughs> but very rewarding uh, for, for all of us at Sloan Kettering. So yes, yes, it, it definitely like 
feel like somebody is taking the baby away from you. And I, I think that, um, but we, we've learned a lot from, from this. And, and it means that actually the baby has grown sufficiently that um, uh, it is mature to, to become a grown up and it needs uh, to go uh, <laughs> into a, a much broader um, uh, uh, population and, and we obviously would not be doing what we're doing at Sloan Kettering if we didn't want it to, to reach um, a larger uh, number of patients. So I, I would go and, and I think the mission of, of this um, academic institution is really to um, test a number of, of these chimeric antigen receptors in different diseases and learn from um, back from the bench, back from the bed to bench. Um, what are the um, um, impediments to uh, as to why these chimeric antigen receptors work in uh, some of the diseases and not in the others, although the target is the same. And uh, Dr. Brunson talked about the microenvironment, and um, so we have some hints as to how we can improve this chimeric antigen receptor and test the next version um, into um, the same disease where we feel like we can improve the uh, rate of, of responses. So that's that's what we're doing at, at this time. So um, the manufacturing process that we're using has been transferred to um, Juno and um, so Juno team members came to our laboratory. They. Um, came into our facilities, learned how to make the product the way we make it, and then took it to their facilities, and um, I'm sure have improved um, some of the process and um, give us some feedback onto what we can improve uh, within the limits of what can be shared, and, and we understand that there are some, some limits, but what's important is that there's a dialogue and, and that we know that we're making products which are equivalent and we um, learn from each other as to um, what, uh, and what direction needs to be taken for the design of the new camera contingent receptor or what we can improve into manufacturing. Um, and um, so right now there is a big initiative nationally and, and to uh, developing um, new ways of manufacturing the cells. Um, it's been um, su it's supported in part by uh, NIST who has put together um, with Georgia Tech um, a manufacturing um, workshop where there was a roadmap that was um, developed to uh, determine what needs to be, uh, what are the um, targets for improving the manufacturing and it can be in terms of instrumentation of measuring in real time these uh, cell culture parameters, making sure that um, we are optimizing the um, cell growth uh, parameters and the characteristic of the cells that we want to maintain during the cultures. Um, so that's going to take the form of some grants that are going to be um, big consortium grants between academic institutions but sh should be driven by industry. And the idea is to try to de-risk de -risk for industry uh, in the uh, pre-commercial space uh, the uh, design of uh, such new um, manufacturing device that can be also uh, – that academic institution can also help to test um, for – so, Isabel, thank you. So, uh, can, can I just make, make one comment to Absolutely, that? Absolutely, please. I mean, it's it's not a, a a choice that we make. It's 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 a natural evolution of a technology. Um, we realized um, that we could sustain uh, the clinical trials and offer this successful therapy only for as long as we had money to do so. We can't charge insurance companies for this. Some of the hospitalizations you can, but. Um, you reach a point where, where philanthropy, there's no grants or funding mechanisms to pay for these types of clinical trials. So you have to make the, it's, it's not a choice of if, it's a choice of when you decide to partner up with, with industry. And when you do so, you can get fortunate. We started looking to license our technology to venture capitalists who would provide what we thought was enough money to run a phase two trial. And we were very naive about that. Um, we were extremely fortunate um, that Juno approached us about our uh, intellectual property uh, to allow us to license to Juno and realizing that this was a company that was somewhat unique because it is a partnership with uh, between industry and academia. And it wasn't just industry and our academic setting, it was an industry and our academic setting as well as the, 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 the Hutch, which we were very, very excited about. 
Um, and yes, I mean, it needs to be said that, 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 that the company that we got partnered with is a company that has its own research facility, its own scientists, and work in co collaboration with us to move this technology along much faster than it would otherwise if it would have stayed as these little uh, centers of excellence around the country. So we were very fortunate, but by the way, things uh, turned out um, uh, when we, we didn't sell the baby, we, we sent the baby to college. <laughs> so, so Raina, thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you in a little bit in terms of the bench to bedside and back to the bench in terms of how you're applying that in going into solid tumors. But let me go to uh, the two uh, panelists who have programs driving towards commercial development phase three. Right? So when you took over tech transfer, there were changes you had to make from a quality perspective, regulatory perspective, manufacturing perspective. Again, very briefly, we still want to try and save some time for the audience participation. What were the major issues where you had to go back to the drawing board and make refinements? And, and I'll come back to Sean uh, once Tina finishes her response in terms of you guys are in phase three, Sean. So what have you learned as being the critical requirements as you drive in terms of being prepared to launch in anticipation of approval? So I think more than making things that much better, we had to learn from MSK how to learn the, or to make and give these products um, as, as a, a new entity. So I, I would, um, echo what both Rainier and Isabel have said, this has been a great collaboration, partnership, whatever you wanna call it, um, where we actually did have to learn from MSK and from the Fred Hutch and from Seattle Children's how to make these products. We did have to change some things. We are changing things, not just because they're better, but because we have to for commercialization to actually scale something that's done at an academic center make it at, at a manufacturing plant uh, that you can then make thousands of lots um, a year. Uh, that's very, um, that's just part of the process. So we have not just done that in isolation. Um, we've learned a lot from all of our founding institutions on, on what works, what doesn't work, uh, and made um, from a manufacturing standpoint the most efficient product we can to get to patients faster, as cheaply as we can. Um, and in a, in a way that can be uh, manufactured the same way over and over with consistency for the safety and efficacy um, that it, it provides. Um, from a clinical standpoint, we also had to learn from our advisors. I think one of the biggest challenges with these complicated therapies is translating it into multi-center trials. So learning from the physicians that are taking care of these patients, how do you give these cells? How do you manage the toxicities? How um, uh, what are what? How do you educate your patients on the risks of these um, types of therapies? And so I, I do feel like um, for for even for the clinical side, we have worked in um, close collaboration with our our founding institutions to try to develop tools for the patient, for the investigators, uh, for the institutions that we're working with on how to apheresis a patient, how to treat a patient and infuse these cells. So I would say one of the biggest challenges has been not just transferring manufacturing protocols, but transferring all of that expertise, the clinical knowledge that they've acquired after treating the first 50 patients with, with those products um, to a company that can then try to scale it and, and um, provide that kind of care to more patients. So uh, I think um, that's the, the benefit that industry can um, add uh, in, in terms of having the resources to truly scale these very innovative products. Thank you, Tina. Sean, just very briefly, what are considerations you guys are thinking about as you think about being having completed accrual in phase three? Yeah, so I think Tina touched on a lot of the, the key points and stuff that we're thinking about. Um, I think to, to piggyback onto some of the things that she mentioned, um, I think there's really kind of two key things that we're really focusing on right now as we, we move towards commercialization. I think the first of which is, you know, chain of identity and the ability to track a product every step along the way. Uh, I think you've heard from everyone here on this panel that it's a very complex manufacturing process. There are multiple touch points. Um, so you need to have a, a very robust system in place and, you know, currently, um, 
you know, I think there are multiple companies out there that have bits and pieces for tracking logistics and supply chain management, et cetera, but there's no one out there that has everything to bring all these pieces together to sufficiently monitor and track chain of identity from when you first collect the cells to when the product is administered directly into the patient. So it's quite challenging to run through all of these different options and figure out how to put all of those pieces of the puzzle together to sufficiently check the chain of identity to make sure the right patient is getting the right product every single time because all it will take is, is one slip up and you know the, the, the repercussions will be quite dramatic. So it's something that we all have to do a very diligent job to make sure we have that in place. I think the other thing that I'll touch on that, um, you know, I think we've done a great job of at Argos uh, and that's through partnerships with, uh, with Invitec and Sangaban, um, is we've actually automated our, our manufacturing process. So, you know, as you think about the necessity to scale up and standardization, um, the ability to automate the process is, is quite attractive, but also very, very challenging. I think, as you've heard from everyone here on the stage, uh, most of our processes have come out of academic institutions and are not up to pharmaceutical grade manufacturing techniques. So there's a tremendous amount of process improvement that needs to be put in place just to get a manual manufacturing process to where it could be automated and reproduced on the type of scale that, that we're talking about. So those are two areas that I think that we are really focusing in on to try to get this from the clinic to the commercialization stage that I think are, are a huge necessity. Thank, thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask, uh, in the interest of time, the audience to uh, think about questions they may have, but I do wanna go back to Reiner in terms of, give us a sense of what you have learned in terms of the bench to bedside. How is that applicable in terms of expanding beyond CD19? And where do you see from a clinical perspective the future and the challenges thereof? And that's the last question we'll come back to audience questions, although we have six, seven minutes left, I believe. Well, I, I started out by saying that we thought the major obstacle was being able to get enough of the genes to express the receptor, and that's not a problem at all, and we're at 90 percent gene transfer nowadays. Um, Fifteen years ago, we knew nothing about the tumor microenvironment, very little about the microenvironment, or even appreciate that there's this balance between a pro-inflammatory and an anti-inflammatory immune response that the tumor utilizes to, um, to, uh, to block an efficient immune response. So a lot of times there's an immune response, as, as, as Steve pointed out earlier, to the tumor, but that tumor response is, is abrogated by that microenvironment that inhibits it. The number of mechanisms I won't go into, but there's at least five, six, seven, probably more ways that the tumor can suppress your immune response. So you can make all the T cells you want in the world. You need to do something more to the T cells. And so along the same lines of what Steve has done with the IL-12 for the TILs, we've put IL-12 into ovarian expressing tumors, and that's our first foray into solid, it's our second foray into solid tumors. So to move to solid tumors, you need to have a, a, a uh, you need to identify proper targets that are not expressed on normal tissues, and then you need to have a healthy respect for what the tumor does to inhibit the cells that you're making. Um, and so to that end, we have started this, this concept of armored cars. These are, chimeric, these are chimeric receptor antigen T cells that have been modified to address that microenvironment to protect it from that suppression, but more importantly when you talk about solid tumors is to recruit the other immune effector cells to uh, that tumor because a tumor can simply turn off whatever target antigen you're going after and we've already seen that with CD19 and you're going to see that with solid tumor. And so I think the most important thing is as we move from what we see in, the, in, the, in, the, in mice to humans and back and forth is that there has to be patience when it comes to getting this to work successfully in solid tumors. And I think that's true for any immunotherapy, is that solid tumors are a much bigger obstacle than the liquid tumors just because of the, the heterogeneity that you see in solid tumors. So I think that, that uh, we'll get it to work in solid tumors, um, but it will require continued uh, support uh, for academia uh, and, and con will require continue support from, from, from industry so that we can test these various methodologies. Again, Model A Ford Mustang. We still have a bunch of iterations to go, I think. Questions from the audience? Yeah, I'd like to know from the panelists, um, to what extent do you use patient advocates in your research uh, programs and processes and even the 
down the research phase into you know, clinical trials and beyond. So Dr. Borello is very um, involved in um, myeloma patient support group, um, both in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and um, that network has actually opened a lot of patients coming to um, Hopkins um, to receive Mills therapy. It's actually something that's very important to us, and um, he has an open dialogue with patients um, about whether or not they would be eligible, and then hopefully someday we're going to be able to tell patients whether or not it would be um, helpful for them to um, to undergo the therapy that we're offering. So it's actually really important to our program. What I can say from Juno's standpoint is that we have started to engage with some patient advocacy programs, particularly with lymphoma and leukemia societies, um, where uh, not just education about CAR T cells, but education about clinical trials in general. So just getting people to understand to look for clinical trials, getting the patients um, engaged and empowered to find these trials on their own, um, because at least we know we've seen very clearly uh, with the age of cellular therapies that patients are seeking these out, and a lot of the patients are traveling a long ways to to find these trials. And so everything we can do to help these groups um, with those educational materials and educating about both our trials, but also just clinical trials in general, and the benefit to to the field um, is is something we're very uh, committed to. She's back there nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we also work very closely with the the LLS, which I think is a outstanding organization. And in fact, a lot of my patients run runs for the LLS, et cetera, and raise money for the LLS. So there is a very nice give and take, and we're all in this together type um, uh, uh, atmosphere that gets created out of that. And, and we're doing work in, in um, multi-myeloma as well and working with the multi-myeloma society. Yeah, so I should also thank the LLS because the, the big clinical trial we're doing right now is actually funded by the LLS um, through the TAP program. So it wouldn't have been possible to do such a big trial without their support. So we'll take one more question. Yeah, so I can speak to it, I guess, for our technology and, and how we're thinking about it. Um, it'll be interesting to kind of hear the perspective from from Gino and some others where, um, you know, toxicity is a little bit more of a concern. Uh, but for our product, um, you know, we've seen very minimal adverse events with our product, so it's not as concerning as we move out to smaller clinics. Uh, so basically what we're looking to do is to you know, build a center of excellence network. So basically what we will do is start with major academic centers, qualify them, educate them, and then disperse out into the community and start to touch some of those smaller academic uh, and, and community sites that would be, that would have an interest in utilizing the product. Um, you know, basically we're going to leverage, uh, you know, existing infrastructures through partnerships that you know, most major academic institutions now have, you know, really profound initiatives to work with smaller community practices in the state. So I'll, I'll use Colorado as an example, right? So University of Colorado works really closely and has built a, a vast network in Colorado to work with a lot of the smaller community sites. So there are connections, there's relationships that are already built there. So we are going to look to leverage those connections to educate and encourage patients um, and practitioners to you know refer patients to major academic centers when they need to but try to keep patients as close to home as much as possible to get the necessary treatment that they need to you know treat and cure their disease so that's kind of our philosophy and, and thought process around it so i think uh, uh one last comment and we're practically out of time here. So. I'll only add that I think it, it will take standardization of the entire process to get this technology to smaller centers. Um, we'll need 
a way to get these cells from patients uh, manufactured and, and get back. But I think from a clinical standpoint, at least from a CAR T cell um, product targeted to CD19, we will have to get toxicity either under control to an incidence that, that um, isn't very common uh, and or uh, early intervention protocols and algorithms that people can use at these smaller centers so their patients um, don't get into trouble with toxicity. Well, uh, hopefully this was educational and uh, uh, please join me in thanking the panel for uh, <laughs>